all for being here. Uh, we know it's been a long day, but there's only six more presentations. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my colleagues are Erin Nelson, Claire Kim, and Tony Cole. I am Suzanne Gilman, and our special editor. Our client is the Upright Federation of Labor, or the AFL. Um, so first of all, we'd like to introduce you to Mark. Mark is a unionized pipe fitter uh, on the All Sands. His union is a member of the I, uh, AFL. In a hypothetical future, trends in the oil sands industry signal that Mark, along with thousands of his colleagues, are going to be losing his job, their jobs. Once unemployed, Mark will be wearing actually two hats. One hat as an unemployed oil sands worker, and another hat as a regular unemployed person. In this presentation, we're going to tell you why Mark's two hats matter, and we're going to tell you how, through our policy recommendations, the AFL can support Mark when he loses his job. So Mark's job has historically been uh, pretty um, unstable. He often loses his job when there's a slump, and then he gets it back when the there's um, an increase in the price of oil. Given uncertainties with access to markets, increased oil production by the U.S. and global and national climate change policies, there's a strong chance that this uncertainty will increase into the future. So first, a little bit about the oil sands. Um, so they're in the blue area on the map. Um, Canada's proven oil reserves are crude oil equal 160. 7 billion barrels, with 163 of these barrels located in the oil sands. This makes Canada home to the third largest proven oil reserves in the world. In 2016, um, the oil sands produced 3.9 million barrels per day, which is about 16.4% of the province's GDP. A little bit about the demographics. There's about 189,000 oil and gas workers across Canada. They are pretty dis they're distributed pretty equally across the industry with the largest proportions in trades, transport and equipment, um, natural resources, business and administration, and natural and applied sciences. In terms of educational attainment, um, uh, it's pretty varied. Also, about a quarter has a university degree, a quarter has a college diploma, and another quarter has a high school or equivalent diploma. There has been an increase of about 7% in the number of workers with university degrees between 2006 and 2016. And in fact, there's been overall an increase in the, in the number or in the degree of educational attainment of oil sands workers. There's also been an increase in diversity uh, between over the last few years. So the number of immigrants and rural minorities and indigenous peoples has increased over the last few years. So now that we understand a little bit more about the oil and gas sectors, um, what can we say it's going to look like in the future? So for this, we've identified three different scenarios, industry transformation, industry substitution, and industry collapse. The industry transformation scenario assumes a change within the industry. So in this case, it also has to undergo a fundamental transformation to make them more sustainable. Unemployment caused by this change would be managed within the industry itself. Uh, through redeployment of workers for rehabilitation of areas previously affected by the oil sands, so um, daily funds. In industry substitution, we see a shift in employment, most likely to a sector that is growing. So, for example, solar and wind energy jobs could take oil sands jobs. And then lastly, in industry collapse, uh, we see that the industry is disrupted and there are no clear substitutes where workers can seek employment. In this case, oil sands workers would join the general unemployment pool and be just like any other unemployed worker. Now I'm going to pass it over to Claire, who's going to tell you more about Mark's first hat, an unemployed oil sands worker. Okay, thank you, Susie. So, thinking about the first hat, unemployed oil sands workers can be regarded as a special category. So in the following section, we'll highlight some of the specific policy options that can help the affected oil sands workers, like Mark in Alberta. So in our report, we uh, derive our policy options from the case study review. And we employ two selection criteria to select our cases. Uh, first is that the case must be about the extractive or reverse industry. And secondly, um, the case must be situated in a free market economy. Then we employ a snowballing method of literature review to uh, select the most relevant cases for our research. And then in the report, we complement our literature review with interviews uh, conducted with various stakeholders. So using the methodology, we um, selected seven case studies. Six of them are about a transition away from coal, with the exception of Pipeline to Canada, which is about the cost of gas. And in the case study analysis, we, in, um, we identify specific policy mechanisms uh, that to fall under seven broader umbrella of policy options. 
We then further categorize these options into two. The first category is the general policy option category, which is marked in green and represents policy options that involve specific government uh, like programs or funding structures. And the second category is the process factor category, which is marked in blue, and represents policy options that help to facilitate the implementation process of the policy options in green. And in the following slides, I will highlight uh, three most prominent policy options and specific examples from these studies to illustrate how they were implemented in real life. So the first policy option is the government's promotion of the new growth industry. In Colorado's case, uh, both the legislation and the new government agenda have established the renewable energy sector as a new growth industry. In the worst case, um, the rural government played an active role in developing AP economic clusters in the region. The second policy option is providing relevant training and education. In Atlanta, Canada's case, the general training programs were found to be irrelevant to the workers, so most of them returned to their fishing villages afterwards. In Alberta's case, the tradition, uh, tuition voucher policy gives the workers the flexibility to tailor their training according to their career interests. And the third policy option is the cross-stakeholder cooperation, and this is crucial because this is key in galvanizing support for the transition policy. And this is best exemplified by Ruhr's Future Initiative Coalition Region, also Alberta's advisory panel on coal community. And now I turn the floor to Aaron, who will evaluate how these policy options can be implemented in Alberta's case. Thank you, Claire. So uh, in our evaluation of these policies, the central item was the standard of living. So, do these policy options uh, maintain the, the, the wealth and material comfort of individuals and communities? We use three broad categories to evaluate that. Uh, the first one was, was viability. Is a broad political support for this option and will it require a lot of financial resources? The second, process. Is it difficult to administer and is, does it provide opportunities for uh, workers and labor to provide input and influence? Outcomes. Does it maintain the standard of living? And does it provide environmentally sustainable jobs? So uh, of all the, uh, the, the seven options that Claire mentioned, three ranked highly along the areas of, um, of uh, pro, uh, labor put, providing an input, environmentally sustainable jobs, and political support. So, and those are promoting new growth industry, relevant retraining and education, and cross-stakeholder cooperation. And now we're gonna go through those individually. Promoting a new growth industry. So this, this promotes economic diversification and long-term economic growth. So we have lots of broad support for that. Um, it also provides new identities for workers and their communities, as it provides new, new jobs, new companies, new industries away from oil and gas. And outcomes, because it diversifies the economy, it provides more high, diversifies the economy with sustainable, uh, environmentally sustain, sustainable jobs. It uh, creates high quality jobs in those areas. Uh, the next with retraining, uh, there is broad public support for retraining as a form of empowerment that is employment focused and can be most cost effective vis-a-vis -vis income supports alone. It is an effective tool when it connects workers to real job prospects, and depending on the program, can be easily administered. And workers are empowered by a job training that is focused on providing them skills needed for emerging technologies and developing, uh, you know, developing industries. So one uh, one innovative program in this in this area is the Power Plus Initiative. And that's a program which provides grants, grant funding for retraining programs that, for uh, partnerships of government, schools, um, uh, businesses, and uh, in the to coal affected workers in the Appalachian region of the United States. Um, the next being uh, cross stakeholder cooperation, which often results in buy-in from the various stakeholders uh, because it provides direct ability to to in provide input into the policy making process, uh, and especially from you know, labor and workers themselves. And this type of policy can also leverage uh, the expertise and resources of multiple stakeholders beyond just government. So as Claire previously shared, the advisory panel on coal communities is one example from Alberta, 
um, uh, where uh, where this was where this happened. But it can also, you know, looking at all the policies we provided, this is something that um, that can lead to more innovative transition supportive policies. So this, these are policies that could help Marx in his first hat as an unemployed old sounds worker. The second hat now is when we looked at Tommy, the second hat being unemployed workers in general. Great, thank you very much, Arvind. So up to this point, we have spoken to you about Mark wearing his first hat as an unemployed all sense worker. As Claire introduced to you at the start of the presentation, this means that we think of him as a special category or a special class of worker, a person who works in the all sense. Mark's second head here is also important, and that is as a general unemployed worker. So someone in the general unemployment pool, not unlike any of us in the room today, who might be unemployed in the future. And we believe that the strategies that respond to unemployed workers in the all sense are different from the strategies that respond to general unemployment. And why does this matter, and why do we want to talk about it today? We think it matters because of the future of work. And this is the concurrent problem that we face. So everything we've said so far relates to industry-specific approaches and solutions and policy options in responding to Marx unemployment. But in the future of work, defined by the World Economic Forum as a perfect storm of business model change resulting in fundamental disruptions to labor markets, things like the fourth industrial revolution, digitization, automation, technology-driven disruption, will fundamentally change how work looks like. What does this mean for Mark? It means that when he's unemployed from the all sense, he might not be able to get work anywhere else. Or at the very least, he might not be able to get work in the way that we think about work today. What do we do about that? We recognize that a lot of times we can't predict what the future of work looks like, and we can't predict the skills that would be necessary. In the words of Bushan Sethi from PwC at the Global Solutions Summit in Berlin last week, while we might not be able to choose or pick winners, we will be able to emphasize some of these transferable skills that will be able to help Mark. And in that vein, we focus on or return to the OECD job strategy in our report as well as in this presentation. Let's start with a caveat that the OECD job strategy might not be something that a lot of people in the room are comfortable with. It is fundamentally high level, it's something that's very general, it's something that a few of you might even consider daft because it doesn't have enough details and policy specific evaluation pieces that currently exist. However, we also believe that it's important and it's important because in responding to the unknowns of the future, responding to the future of work, a lot of these things are necessarily high level and require a vision that allows for policymakers working in, working hand in hand with the Alberta Federation of Labor and other stakeholders to develop strategies that help ensure that the future of work for people like Mark is something that is secure. So let's take you quickly through the OECD job strategy. There are three main principles here, again, very high level, promoting an environment in which quality jobs can flourish, preventing labor market exclusion, and preparing for future opportunities in ways that are creative and innovative. The job strategy itself calls for 20 policy options, and we produced two for you here on the slide today. The first of which is adopting a life cost perspective, and the second of which is considering using a statutory minimum wage. What we'd we'll like you to take away from this slide is that these policy options are inherently multilateral. They require multiple stakeholders to act together. It's insufficient for the all sense industry to act unilaterally. It's insufficient for Alberta to act unilaterally. A lot of these things require broad-based coalition building. And we think this is fundamentally important for our client, the Alberta Federation of Labor, because in thinking and in responding to the future of work, the AFL can then think about how to build coalitions that enable them to protect the standard of living of all sense workers by, for instance, partnering with education institutions that are thinking about life course training, or perhaps petitioning federal governments or even international governments if we're concerned about normalizing a federal or international minimum wage. There is some urgency here, and the urgency is because we don't know how quickly technology is moving through global value chains. So we don't know if the future of work is going to come upon us in half a decade, in a decade, or maybe later on in the future. So where does that leave us? That leaves us in a situation where we acknowledge the unknowns that exist in the future of work, but at the same time develop three policy options, 
like those that Claire and Aaron have shared with you today, which are inherently flexible and adaptable, and enable the AFL to champion solutions that will be able to respond and adjust to the future of work. That's what we believe we can deliver today. Flexible solutions that can adjust and adapt to uncertain futures. We recognize that a lot of these solutions might not be evaluated in a way that a lot of us in the room today are comfortable with, but at the same time, it's important for us to acknowledge that while we draw on industry best practices through our case study analysis, we also want to take into account the fact that the future of work might not look like the present day's reality of work. Where does that leave Mark? Coming back to Mark, we believe that the three solutions that we propose at Alberta Federation of Labour today are compelling solutions, they are viable, and they are something that can help preserve Mark's standard of living. But at the same time, we believe that taking into account Mark's two hats, both as an unemployed all-sense worker and as an unemployed worker, will give him the best fighting chance in ensuring <coughs> that we can protect his employment and protect his standard of living in the future. It is by taking into account Mark's two hats that we can preserve the standard of living and that we can set Mark up for success. Thank you. Thank you guys for the presentation. Uh, so just on the recommendations part, uh, McKinsey uh, estimates that around 800 million jobs will be lost due to automation. In Canada, Brookfield is, uh, Institute estimates around 42 million jobs to be lost. So how do your recommendations specifically cater to Alberta? How, why don't you just apply them across the board? What makes your case significant, different, and your recommendations specific to your field? Thanks, Ali. And we believe that our recommendations need to necessarily embed themselves in a broader, more general context. So we believe that the AFL, our client, will be able to advocate for generalist approaches, a generalist toolkit, essentially, both at home as well as at the federal level and at the international level. So we believe that based on our recommendations, our three recommendations today, of finding new industries, of retraining, and of cooperation, are things that the AFL can do both at the local level, but something that they can also advocate on at a federal level. Right? So we don't necessarily see those things as independent or mutually exclusive, because they need to work together. And the AFL isn't going to get a lot of traction if it merely tries to do this at home alone. So in response to your question, we, we don't think it's necessarily specific, but it's something that's important for our client to keep in mind the broader context in which they operate, the broader context in which they build coalitions. And automation is already happening on the oil sands, and there are already workers losing jobs to automation. Um, and this is why we advocate training, right? So workers are preemptively being um, well supported to take on these jobs that require somebody to operate the machines, right? This follow up. Just on that note. Uh, when you said training, uh, do you have any specific kinds of training? When you, have you looked at any specific training that for your client? So we are interviewing various um, stakeholders like nonprofits that are in this uh, in the training part of the aspect of it, and one of them is Iron and Earth. So they specifically train oil science workers to transition from oil science to renewable energy sector. So um, and in, more specifically, the solar industry. And a lot of the skills, um, according to them, are transferable. So they just need a couple of more specific trainings um, provided by these organizations, funded by governments, uh, to facilitate this transition. Sorry, just one quick note. Um, there's a program that Alberta Labor is doing called Tech Alberta. Um, and they're specifically targeting oil science workers to get uh, 24 weeks of training in tech. Um, so, you know, computer programming, that type of stuff. Great presentation. Uh, can you define Mark for me? Is Mark a direct oil science worker, indirect, induced? Is Mark a fly in, fly out worker? Can you define and explain that? Excellent, excellent question. So, can um, I put but, recommendations be the same for different types of marks? <laughs> <laughs> Mark was temporary. 
So our, our client, uh, the AFL, uh, was most interested in unionized workers, but oil sands. Oil sands workers of the 190,000 that, uh, that Susie talk, Suzanne talked about, there's 32,000 that work in the oil sands. And those are the ones that we're most interested in. Um, I mean, these, these policies would apply to them as well, but as talked about before, these, these, these policies are kind of broad principles, really, that should be adapted to the specific needs of each type of worker. Um, yes? <laughs> I just have uh, one question. About, so I work in oil and gas in Alberta in Canada, and for the most part, there's there's sort of an, uh, like a social identity of being part of oil and gas work, and most people that I've talked to in the industry can't really see themselves working in something in opposition to, like uh, renewable energy is almost the enemy of the identity that they belong to. So is that incorporated in your analysis of uh, factoring the social identity of the work that they do in the industry and the transition, how that will affect their new identity? Uh, yes, actually it's, it's a, it certainly did factor in. A lot of our case studies had the same challenge as well. If you think about uh, Appalachia, Ruhr, other coal communities, they're very much tied. The identity is tied in the community to, to the employer. Um, it becomes like an extended family in, in a way. Um, some, in some cases, like uh, Appalachia, they have been <coughs> had a long, it's been a long journey. And what we found in some of the interviews we did was that having those local actors be involved in the policy making process, they can start to um, start to evolve these identities. So it's not, being in Alberta is not, you're not an oil and gas person. Like as a value, like from a values perspective, for me being in Alberta is being industrious, being entrepreneurial, being resourceful, which may not be necessarily tied to oil and gas. There will be the next oil and gas. And adding on to it, I think apart from the fact that identities change, the question then would be whether oil and gas remains viable half a century later, right? And if it's not, then how are we going to change, or how is Alberta going to change its identity in a way that remains economically viable? And I think that's where we believe that our investments in things like identifying new industries and creating interest around those industries will be helpful to our client and also be helpful in shaping some of those new identities. Just, just one, one quick add-on is in the, the Ruhr, which has been going through this process since the early 60s. One thing that they did that was quite helpful was to actually change some of the physical environments. So abandoned mines were um, recreated into, into lakes and they re, re, uh, repurposed a lot of the buildings that were involved with, with mining and with uh, processing into other uses. So that helps, the physical changes helps to also change your attitude about who you are as a person, who your community is as well. There's a question. So, yeah, we have a three-part question over here from your client, Patrick. Patrick. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> three-part question from Patrick uh, for the team. So, first of all, he says the team has done a great job on this project, and he appreciates you talking about the future of work challenge. So his first question I'll read is regarding the recommendation to develop new growth industry to replace oil sands. Did the research find out how long it generally takes for an industry to grow from new to mature in a way that supports the workforce and generates economic activity as large as the oil sands? I'll start us off. I think that's a great question. Hi Patrick, I guess you're watching um, on Skype for Business. And I think one of the challenges that we faced in terms of thinking and reimagining the future of work and industries and the future of work is that a lot of efforts to create new industries and a lot of efforts to reimagine what industries look like with disruptions due to automation and digitization is that all of these industries are by nature and by definition still infant, right? So if you think about how many people work in tech or how many people work in new tech industries, we don't necessarily have the runway or the data runway in order to identify how long it takes for them to become mature. So 
the first piece of it is, I guess, we just simply don't know because the future of work is new and it's something that's still being involved and it's something that countries and well, cities are still responding to. Uh, just a quick note is that that's why we point out the cross-stakeholder cooperation because when these things start to come up, then you know that you have stakeholders who are going to be willing and able to cooperate with each other and really take advantage of those new opportunities that are coming up. I would also add another big piece of this is political willpower and vision. Uh, that's one thing that came up with a lot of our stakeholder interviews is that um, change takes takes time, but it also takes a lot of um, political capital. Uh, if you think about you know Alberta again, when Peter Lockheed in the, the early '80s um, took a lot of political capital, but as, as well as a lot of money. I mean, the, the government invested over four hundred million dollars in making helping to make the oil sands. Um, um, sustainable, um, a fruitful industry. <laughs> so so um, the time part can also be directly attributed to political vision, political capital to make it happen. Great, thank you. Uh, his second question on that vein, he might have missed it in your presentation, but he asks, what do you identify as some potential new growth industries that utilize Alberta's strengths and comparative advantage for the best chance of success? So uh, one agency that we had up on the slide, but I, uh, I now have the opportunity to talk about, is uh, Alberta Innovation, which is a provincial agency that's um, identified several growth sectors, uh, including health, uh, bioagriculture, bio bioagriculture, and uh, clean tech. So um, the, this is something they're actively pursuing now. Um, yes. <laughs> Great, and I'll ask his third question. Given that the current government is investing in renewables and other diversification efforts, what is your opinion on the potential of those initiatives to support the kind of transition they're speaking about? They're speaking about. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Given that the current government is investing in renewables and other diversification efforts, what is your opinion on the potential of those initiatives to support the kind of transition you're speaking about? I mean, yes, it's it's definitely uh, investing in those renewables, but there's a, a, a lot of investment going towards uh, expanding the oil sands at the moment. So to the extent that those um, that the focus on the government remains on the oil sands, which um, we would argue has been largely the case, those opportunities are going to be limited. And I guess just as the mic travels, like on the renewables question, if the government is investing in new renewable sectors and um, industries, and there is something that can provide jobs in the long term, that's something that we're definitely comfortable with, and we see that as renewable industries consistent in our work. Yes. All right, oh, yes. oh, great work. I'm from Alberta, so Alberta <laughs> lost a lot of jobs in the past few years. Thank you for uh, picking up this important topic. Uh, I know a lot of marks in Alberta, the mark that drive the truck in oil science, the mark that does the land surveys, and a lot of marks actually in the high-tech industry. Some people would, would say that oil science industry today, other than some very small percentage, is high-tech industry itself. So my question now is what about uh, the policy um, that the government may not ad adopt? You know the election is going on in Alberta. Jason Kennedy's United Conservative Party basically saying they're going to redefine the oil sand job growth by doing more of the oil sands and other resource sectors. And if all the polls are hold, it is Jason Kennedy's election to lose at this point in a few weeks' time. Your policy options uh, recommendations are very good, very future oriented, but it may not be adopted by the government that's going to win the election. Uh, so, what is your, what do you say to the premises that uh, the mark or the marks who work in the oil sands are just fine and they will not change the landscape and they were just going to set up the war room, as Jason Penny said, to promote this industry? I'll, I'll kick us off and 
I think maybe a large part of that is about coalition building on the part of our clients and on the part of folks in the room who are invested on this issue to lead to political change, right? And if Jason Kennedy is going to win this election, the Conservatives are going to win this election, maybe what, it's, what this is is that we need to keep this as a drawn memo for five, ten years later where all the guests becomes less viable. So I do think that Future Oriented Strategies offers a basis and a premise for the Alberta Federation of Labour to build coalitions of support around what kind of policies they would support and in turn then maybe what kind of politics they would support. Did that answer your question? Because <laughs> I wasn't quite clear on what your question was, so Tommy answered it great otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. No, I'm just saying you may have good ideas, but the current government in the future, the future government may not pick it up as a yeah. policy option at all. Um, that might be the challenge, yeah. I think. Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, so the current government that's been in there now, they've had an opportunity for the past four or five years, and they've made some headway, but they've also yeah. invested quite a bit in sustaining the oil and gas industry. If you think about the three billion dollars in subsidies that provincially and federally are there, that doesn't include the, the rail cars. So um, there, like we said before, there needs to be political uh, willpower and vision to make these uh, options reality. 